Coming up on Arirang News. For three days starting today, the government deploys more than 200 military doctors to hospital emergency rooms amid worries over medical staff shortages. The state-run think tank's latest assessment says weak domestic consumption has hindered South Korea's economic recovery, despite robust export growth. Paris bids farewell to the 2024 Paralympic Games after a 12-day journey of competition. Team Korea finished 22nd overall in the medal standings, winning 6 gold, 10 silver and 14 bronze. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. I'm Kim Bo-kyung. We start with the latest on the country's medical sector dispute. More than 200 military doctors will be additionally deployed to address emergency room staffing shortages. Meanwhile, as early admissions for medical schools commence, the Education Ministry has ruled out reversing the planned quota increase as requested by doctors. Iuni has the details. More military doctors will be deployed to help with the emergency room staffing shortages. The Ministry of Health and Welfare announced that following the dispatching of 15 last week, 235 additional military doctors will be gradually assigned to medical facilities from Monday to Wednesday. Despite some of the military doctors requesting to return and refusing to work as they lack the necessary experience, the government is committed to enhancing training and communication. Meanwhile, South Korean lawmakers are working to address concerns about potential disruptions in the medical system ahead of the Chuseok holiday. Floor leaders of the rival parties met with the National Assembly Speaker on Monday and agreed to work together to bring doctors to the discussion table. This follows a proposal by the People Power Party to establish a joint consultative body involving rival parties, the government and relevant members of the medical community to resolve disputes related to the medical reform. However, the Korean Medical Association said it is hesitant about participating in the talks as it is demanding that the government scraps its plan to increase next year's medical school quota. The association also reaffirmed its position in a public statement released on Monday, asserting that the only way to bring back the trainee doctors is for the government to fully withdraw its plan to expand medical school quotas. The statement also highlighted the worsening health care crisis, noting that without the trainee doctors, not only are emergency rooms overwhelmed, but even the so-called Big Five hospitals are struggling and their remaining staff are exhausted. Amid the ongoing dispute with no clear resolution in sight, the early admissions process for medical schools began Monday, confirming that the government's original plan to increase the med school quota by 2,000 from next year remains unchanged. And with the admission process already underway, the Ministry of Education has stated that reversing the increase would create considerable confusion, so no changes will be considered. Ian Hee, Arirang News. Ahead of President Yoon Suk-yeol's visit to the Czech Republic this month, the country's Foreign Minister Jan Ripovsky expressed confidence that the upcoming visit will open a new chapter in bilateral relations. While meeting with his Korean counterpart Cho Taehyung today in Seoul, he said a South Korean company being selected as a preferred bidder to build two nuclear power plants in the Czech Republic was a groundbreaking moment in relations between the two countries. Noting that South Korea is the fourth largest foreign investor in the Czech Republic, he also explained the country currently has a great business environment for Korean companies, adding that it's prepared to welcome Korean investments particularly on gigafactories, semiconductors, and hydrogen production. Shifting gears to the economy, the latest assessment by Korea's state-run think tank reveals the economy showing signs of constrained improvement as demand at home remains weak. Our Lee Soo-jin explains. Limited improvement in economic conditions due to a delayed recovery of domestic demand. This is how a major state-run think tank, the Korea Development Institute, evaluated South Korea's economy in its monthly report released on Monday. It's the tenth consecutive month that the KDI said in its report the economy is experiencing weak domestic demand and stands in contrast to the government's assessment that the domestic demand is showing signs of recovery. The government thinks that the robust exports will also boost domestic demand, but I don't think this will happen very easily. 
While this year's economic growth will reach the mid-2% range, most of it will be driven by exports. The nation's industrial output and consumption both fell in July, reflecting weak domestic demand. While industrial output rose 2.7 percent from the previous year, it fell 0.4 percent on month, the third consecutive month that the index has declined compared to the previous month. This was mainly due to production in the mining and manufacturing industries dropping 3.6 percent on month, the largest drop since December 2022. And retail sales, an indicator of consumer spending, dropped 2.1 percent on year in July. The value of construction completed fell again in July, dropping 5.3 percent on year for the second straight month. But exports remained solid on the back of robust demand in the ICT sector. The value of exports in August reached 57.9 billion U.S. dollars, rising 11.4 percent compared to last year. This marked the largest export figure for the month of August on record and was the 11th straight month that exports posted growth. Shipment of seven out of 15 key export items rose, with exports of semiconductors jumping 38.8 percent on year, computers a whopping 183.2 percent, and wireless communication devices more than 50 percent. Meanwhile, inflation in August also eased to the government's target level of 2 percent, the lowest seen since March 2021. This came after the consumer price index rose 2.6 percent the previous month. As for the global economy, the report said that it continues to show moderate growth, mostly in the service sector, but the uncertainties remain due to high interest rates, ongoing geopolitical tensions, and weaknesses in the manufacturing sector. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. Following liquidity crisis at e-commerce platforms, e platforms, that is, Timon and Rime Price recently creating massive chaos in Korea. The authorities and the ruling party today unveiled their plans to strengthen measures against harmful trade practices. Our issue explains what those are. Soon, online sellers here making profits through harmful or anti-competitive practices will have to alter their sales tricks. On Monday, officials from relevant government ministries and the ruling People Par Party announced new plans to stop e-commerce platforms from exploiting individual sellers and making sales through unethical practices. Until now, it was common for platforms to beat out competitors by giving preferential promotions for their own products, carrying out tie-in sales and demanding the lowest possible supply prices from sellers. However, all these prices will likely be banned and the platforms will be fined at a higher rate as the administration and the PPP introduce new changes to current rules. The ruling party members of the National Assembly Legislation Committee will introduce changes to two current laws, the Monopoly Regulation and Fair Trade Act and the Act on Fair Transactions in Large Retail Business. This will make it fundamentally illegal to cheat customers and legally require the platforms to provide swift payments to sellers while also improving their liquidity ratio. The long-anticipated measures follow nationwide market chaos from early July, caused by liquidity issues at platforms Timon and WeMake Price. Subsequent government support measures soon after help sellers awaiting payment and customers waiting for refunds, but there have since been numerous calls for measures for proactive prevention. Lee si hu Arirang News. In other news, North Korea celebrated the 76th anniversary of the regime's founding on Sunday, with key officials visiting the mausoleum displaying the bodies of its two previous leaders. But there was no mention of its leader Kim Jong-un attending these events. Let's take a look at the details. The reclusive regime held celebratory events to mark the 76th anniversary of its founding, but with leader Kim Jong-un absent. According to state media on Monday, key North Korean officials, including Premier Kim Dokun, visited the Kumsutan Palace of the Sun, where the embalmed bodies of Kim Jong-un's father, Kim Jong-il, and grandfather Kim Il-sung lie in state. North Korea has been celebrating September 9th as National Founding Day, and Kim visited the mausoleum in 2012, 2018, and 2021, but he apparently skipped the visit this year. The regime also held an outside rally and evening gala in Pyongyang on Sunday. Visiting delegates from an association of Koreans residing in Japan were also among the audience, who came for the celebration for the first time in five years. 
Regarding the regime leader Kim Jong-un's absence from the event, an expert says there is a high chance he could be pondering on ways to deal with domestic issues. When he is not attending important political celebrations, it could be to give out the message that the leader is mulling over which significant policy direction the regime needs to take. It is highly likely he will later explain what he has mulled over during that time. When it comes to the possibility of North Korea staging provocations this week to celebrate the anniversary, the expert said it was unlikely. Because the U.S. is focusing on the upcoming presidential election, North Korea knows it would not be able to get enough attention, even if it stages provocations. Kim would think it is much better to focus on economic development and improving livelihoods during this time. Staying with the regime's founding anniversary, leaders of China and Russia have sent congratulatory messages to North Korea's Kim Jong-un. The North state-run news agency said Monday that Chinese President Xi Jinping in his message called for deeper strategic communication and cooperation with Pyongyang, and that Russian President Vladimir Putin said a comprehensive strategic partnership would be strengthened between Pyongyang and Moscow. While North Korea and Russia have drawn closer in recent months, relations between North Korea and China have seen deterioration since the start of the Ukraine war. This is the first message from Xi to Kim since New Year's Day. Back here in Seoul, the International Re-AIM Summit began today, bringing together high-level delegations from around the world for two-day discussion on responsible use of AI in the military domain for peace and security. Our Kim jong sil has more. The Re-AIM Summit, a platform for global discussions on the responsible use of AI in military applications, kicked off on Monday in the South Korean capital. Following the first summit co-hosted by South Korea with the Netherlands in The Hague, this second summit was co-hosted by South Korea, the Netherlands, Singapore, Kenya and the UK. South Korean Foreign Minister Cho tae stressed the importance of the summit amid rising geopolitical tensions. Faced with profound uncertainties on both technological and geopolitical fronts, it is all the more imperative that we set the norms and governance responsible AI to ensure international peace and security and to preserve human dignity. Minister Cho called for a balanced assessment of AI's impact on global peace and security. He also highlighted the importance of pooling ideas to ensure the responsible use of AI and called for a robust governance framework to establish guardrails. The Netherlands Defense Minister Ruben Breckelmans also underscored the importance of international cooperation. REAIM shows that we stand united in dealing with current challenges. It represents our shared dedication to develop and deploy applications of AI in a responsible way. Delegations from more than 90 countries took part in the summit along with experts in the military and AI sectors. And South Korea is a global leader in technology and is really innovating in ways to use AI and autonomy in the military space as well. He further addressed why stakeholders need to discuss the responsible use of AI in the military domain. The technology is widely available. Anyone can go online and download AI tools that they can use. And so I think we need to assume that competitor nations rogue nations, terrorist groups, all have access to AI. And we just need to find ways to ensure that um, the AI that we're using for defense is better. On the second day, the REAIM Summit plans to adopt a blueprint for action that aims to outline guidelines for responsible AI governance. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. On the international front, the death toll as a result of Israeli strikes targeting military bases in Syria has risen, upping tension in the Middle East. Our Bunerian reports. 
At least 14 people have been killed in Israeli airstrikes in Syria, according to Syrian state media. On Monday morning local time, Syrian Arab news agency cited a health official saying that 43 more were wounded from the strikes that targeted several military bases across central Syria. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, a UK-based war monitor, reported that 18 people were killed and of them, four were civilians. The SOHR also said that the strikes targeted a science research area, along with other sites which led to the outbreak of fires and material damage. The Israeli military declined to comment on reports in the foreign media, while Iran's foreign ministry condemned it as a criminal attack, and Syria's foreign ministry called it blatant aggression. Hundreds of strikes on war-torn Syria have been carried out by Israeli military in recent years, often targeting Iranian-backed groups. Since the conflict in Gaza began in October, Israel has reportedly increased the number and intensity of its strikes in response to cross-border attacks from Hezbollah and other groups in Lebanon and Syria. According to the SOHR, there have been 64 Israeli air and artillery strikes in Syrian territory since the start of the year, leading to the damage or destruction of roughly 140 targets. These strikes killed 205 fighters and 142 others, including 24 civilians. Back in April, Iran accused Israel of an airstrike on a consulate in Damascus that killed two top Revolutionary Guards commanders. In response, Iran launched its first direct military attack on Israel, firing 300 missiles and drones. Moon Hyeon, Arirang News. Staying in the Middle East, three Israelis have been killed in a shooting at a border crossing between the West Bank and Jordan, reportedly by a Jordanian man. This comes amid Israel continuing its ground operation in the West Bank. Our Chesion has the latest. Three Israelis have been shot and killed on the border between the West Bank and Jordan. On Sunday local time, the Israel Defense Forces reported that a shooter got off a truck and killed three people with a handgun at the Allenby Bridge crossing over the Jordan River. The IDF called this a terror attack and said a shooter was then shot and killed by the Israeli forces. According to the Times of Israel newspaper, the shooter was a 39-year-old truck driver from Jordan named Meir Diaf Hussein al-Zazi, and two of the three victims were in their 60s, while the age of the other victim was not given. What I saw with my own eyes, we were sitting and standing at the checkpoint waiting for our turn after the bus in front of us was searched. There was a bus and a truck in front of us. A man got out and carried out the operation. We bus passengers didn't know what to do and we were panicking. Israel and Jordan closed the Allenby Bridge after the incident, and Israel also closed two other checkpoints connecting to Jordan. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that a cowardly terrorist brutally murdered three innocent Israeli civilians. Hamas praised the shooter, calling him one of Jordan's brave men. Since the end of August, Israel has been carrying out military operations in the West Bank, claiming to destroy the infrastructure of terrorism. On September 6, a 20-year-old Turkish-American woman was shot dead by Israeli forces during a protest. The U.S. has asked Israel to investigate the incident. On September 7, Turkey Air called for an anti-Israel alliance, saying that the only way to stop Israel's actions is the unification among Muslim countries. Chis Hyung, Adirang News. Elsewhere, Russia's defense ministry said Sunday that it had seized control of a town in eastern Ukraine as it continues its offensive in Donetsk and moves closer to the strategically important city of Pokrovsk. The Kremlin said it had captured the town of Novogrodivka, located about 12 kilometers from the city that serves Ukraine's military as a key hub for rail and road logistics. According to reports, Russian President Vladimir Putin said Ukraine's incursion into Kursk had not slowed Russia's advance in eastern Ukraine and had even weakened Kyiv's frontline defenses. Turning to the presidential election in the U.S., in three key swing states, Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin, Harris and Trump are in a very tight race. 
On Sunday local time, a CBS News poll found that in Pennsylvania, where their TV debate will take place on September 10th local time, both candidates have equal support at 50 percent. In Michigan and Wisconsin, Harris has 50 percent and 51 percent respectively, while Trump has 49 percent in both states. These states have frequently changed their support between parties, making them important battlegrounds in U.S. presidential elections. The 2024 Paris Paralympics ended its 12-day journey with a grand closing ceremony on Sunday. Four years from now, the drama and inspiration will continue in Los Angeles. Lee Sing Jae reports. The Paralympics flame that has lit the French capital of Paris for 12 days is now extinguished, marking the end of the 2024 Paris Paralympic Games. The event, filled with inspiration, drama and celebration, came to an end with the closing ceremony taking place at Stade de France in Saint-Denis on Sunday. Including a refugee team, a total of 4,567 para-athletes from 169 National Paralympic Committee member countries competed, with 549 gold medals up for grabs in 22 events. Much like the Paris Olympics, South Korea exceeded its own expectations, surpassing its goal of five gold medals. With 83 para-athletes competing, South Korea won six gold medals, 10 silver and 14 bronze, finishing 22nd overall in the medal standings. South Korea won its sixth gold medal on Saturday, thanks to Kim Young-gun's gold medal finish in the men's table tennis singles. It was also Kim's fifth career Paralympics gold, meaning he's now tied in second place for most Paralympics golds in South Korean history. China finished with the most gold medals with 94, followed by the UK at 49 and the United States at 36. Meanwhile, South Korean para-Nordic skier Won Yumin was elected to the International Paralympic Committee's Athletes' Council on Saturday, earning 296 votes and becoming one of six new members to join. Won will serve a four-year term representing para-athletes around the world and giving feedback on global sports policies for the para-athletes. With the curtain now drawing on Paris, para-athletes around the world will continue their pursuit of going up against all odds and bringing more inspiration and joy to the Paralympics in Los Angeles four years from now. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. It's September, but the weather still feels like midsummer. Seoul's record for the latest heat wave is September 8, 1935. Since it rose to 34 degrees Celsius today, it set a new record for the latest heat wave ever. This heat will not be dampened, and tomorrow will be as hot as today. Tomorrow, the daytime temperature in Seoul will be 33 degrees, similar to today. It will rain up to 80 millimeters on Jeju Island tomorrow afternoon and 5 to 20 in eastern parts of Gangwon-do province on Wednesday. There could be around 20 millimeters of rain per hour with thunder and lightning. Tomorrow's Seoul and Busan will start off at 25 degrees. Highs will move up to 34 in Daejeon, Daegu and Gyeongju. The heat wave and tropical nights are expected to continue throughout the week. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world. That's all we have for today. Thank you for watching. Arirang News will be back at 9 a.m. Korea time.